you probably recognize the passages on the screen as somewhat famous tongue twisters. Try saying either or both five times fast and see how you do. Of course, the term tongue twister is a misnomer. Your tongue doesn't actually become twisted by trying to say these expressions. It just feels that way. But as you're trying to work your tongue around these complex prose, think about the complex muscular contractions that must be made to produce all of these different sets of sounds. These muscles will be investigated today in our look at the oral cavity. Good day and welcome to this lecture session on the oral cavity. The oral cavity represents the start of the digestive system in which food is broken down through mechanical digestion before passing through the pharynx into the esophagus. It can also serve as an alternate route for air passing in and out of the lungs and in generating specific sounds during speech. With eating and speaking, the complex movements made by the tongue are critically important in working the food around and in generating the various phonations used in making words. In today's session, we'll start by looking at the boundaries that make up the oral cavity, then take an in-depth look at the anatomy of the palate, which makes up the roof of the oral cavity, followed by the floor of the oral cavity and the tongue and associated salivary glands. The oral cavity itself can be divided into two separate portions. The oral vestibule is the external portion of the cavity found deep to the lips and mucosal lining of the cheeks, which form the outer perimeter of the cavity. The cheeks, or buccae, are reinforced by the buccinator muscle and buccal fat pads. These buccal fat pads are particularly pronounced in infants, which helps in compressing the cheeks during nursing. The mucosal membrane contains numerous glands that secrete an aqueous fluid to help lubricate the walls of the cavity. The cheeks thicken anteriorly to form the lips. When the mouth is open, the space between the lips is known as the oral fissure, which separates the vestibule from the external environment. The oral cavity proper lies deep to the vestibule, deep to a semicircular fold formed by the teeth and gums and contains the main contents of the oral cavity. It is continuous with the oropharynx posteriorly. The gingiva envelop the outer surface of the upper and lower jaw and is composed of a fibrous material covered by a mucous membrane that is continuous with the lining of the cheeks. The gingiva are firmly anchored to the alveolar processes through the periodontium lining the sockets. The teeth are characterized by their form and function. On either side of the midline, in both upper and lower jaws are two spade-shaped incisors. The four upper incisors combine with the four lower incisors to bite cleanly through food morsels to break off a small quantity of food at a time. Lateral to the incisors is a single pyramid-shaped cuspid or canine tooth. The upper and lower cuspids come together to pierce through a food morsel which can then be torn off and consumed. Posterior to the cuspids are two premolar and two molar teeth, which crush and grind ingested morsels of food into malleable portions that can be swallowed. In late adolescence, a third molar, or wisdom tooth, will erupt. Because of the limited space in the upper and lower jaws, these teeth have a tendency to become impacted and are often surgically removed to avoid complications. The palate forms the roof of the oral cavity. The internal lining of the palate is once again formed by a mucosal covering of a dense mixture of fat and glandular tissue embedded in a fibrous matrix. In broad terms, the palate can be divided into two distinct regions. Anteriorly, the base of the hard palate is made up of a bony plate consisting of the maxilla and palatine bones. Just posterior to the central incisors is the incisive fossa, which accommodate the nasopalatine nerve branches originating off the ophthalmic nerve. Posteriorly, the greater palatine foramen lies medial to the third molar and accommodates passage of the greater palatine artery and nerve. Just posterior to the greater palatine foramen is the lesser palatine foramen, which accommodates passage of the lesser palatine neurovascular bundle. 
The posterior border of the hard palate is continuous with the fibromuscular soft palate. The anterior portion of the soft palate is made up of a tendinous aponeurosis, which multiple muscles attach into. Posteriorly, the palate is more muscular, terminating in a free margin that curves inferiorly. The uvula is the most prominent structure along this margin, dangling in the midline and one of the most recognizable structures in the open mouth. The soft palate serves as an important role in regulating the correct passage of ingested material during swallowing. During the initial stages of swallowing, the soft palate tenses and works with the tongue to compress morsels of chewed food substances, referred to as boluses, into a shape that is conducive for movement through the esophagus. In the later stages of swallowing, as the food bolus passes into the oropharynx, muscle contractions elevate and pull the soft palate anteriorly, which serves to block the internal nares and close off the passage into the nasal cavity. Take a moment and try to breathe in as you swallow. It doesn't work too well, does it? The blockage of the nasal passage by the soft palate is in part responsible for this restriction in breathing. Of course, the blockage is not foolproof. We have all had the experience of coughing or laughing unexpectedly with a mouthful of food or drink. These forceful contractions push material being swallowed back up the esophagus and past the soft palate as it relaxes. A number of muscles act on the palate to facilitate its motions, the majority of which are innervated by the vagus nerve. The levator villi palatini is a sling-like muscle that originates off the temporal bone and the cartilage of the eustachian tube. The fibers project inferomedially to insert on the upper aspect of the soft palate, along the midline. The levator villi palatini is the principal muscle involved in the elevation of the soft palate during the later stages of swallowing. Just anterior to the levator villi palatini is the tensor villi palatini. The fibers are distinct from the levator muscle in that they run vertically rather than obliquely. The muscle is also distinct among the palatal muscles in being innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. As the name implies, the tensor villi palatini contracts to tense the soft palate in the early stages of swallowing to assist in compression of food morsels. To understand the function of these two muscles, it's necessary to study the line of pull of the muscle fibers. The levator resembles a hammock, with fibers projecting off the inferior surface of the skull directly onto the soft palate. As a result, contraction of the muscle pulls the soft palate superiorly. The tensor, on the other hand, hooks under the pterygoid hamulus, which serves as a pulley for this muscle. As a result, the line of pull is directed bilaterally, putting tension into the soft palate similar to as if you were to take a hand towel and pull in it bilaterally to make it taut. The final two muscles project inferiorly from the soft palate to the tongue and oropharynx. This creates folds that are visible with inspection of the oral cavity. The more anterior of these is the palatal glossal fold which runs from the soft palate to the base of the tongue. This fold is created by the palatal glossus muscle which contracts to either depress the soft palate or elevate the tongue, depending on the other muscles that are being contracted. Posterior to this is the palatal pharyngeal fold, which runs from the soft palate to blend into the mucosal lining of the pharynx. This fold is created by the palatal pharyngeus muscle, which again serves to depress the soft palate or elevate the pharynx, depending on the muscles it works synergistically with. The recess between these two columns is the location of the palatine tonsil. The palatine tonsil has notoriety in being the target of removal in a tonsillectomy. This is a common outpatient procedure used to resolve frequently recurring sore throat and sleep apnea. The procedure seems to have little long-term effects on the immune system, despite the role of the palatine tonsils in maturation of white blood cells. Although a routine operation, there are complications to the procedure, chief among them being excessive bleeding from the tonsillar branch of the facial artery, located deep within the recess. The procedure is less commonly used compared to the 1970s, as research has indicated that the procedure is only beneficial in limited situations. The hard and soft palate are supplied by the greater and lesser palatine arteries and nerves, respectively.
These were previously discussed in her video lecture on the infratemporal fossa and are what course through the greater and lesser palatine foramen to run just deep to the thick palatal mucosa. The anterior aspect of the palate is supplied by the branch of the nasal palatine nerve, which passes through the incisive fossa. The incisive fossa is therefore the target of nerve block for dental procedures involving the posterior surface of the incisors and associated gingiva. On the other hand, dental procedures related to the palate typically involve blocking of the greater palatine nerve. The precise location of the block is a matter of debate. Anterior blocks tend to be associated with greater degree of initial discomfort to the patient, whereas posterior blocks run a greater risk of affecting the muscles of the soft palate, which can result in temporary complications in swallowing and speaking. The next topic of discussion is the tongue. This is a dynamic muscular organ that assists with chewing, swallowing, and speaking. In addition, the tongue is the organ of taste, which allows us to determine the quality of the food we ingest and detect substances that could be toxic to the body, such as spoiled food. The main portion of the tongue is the root, which serves as the anchoring point to the base of the mouth through a series of muscular attachments we are about to discuss, and the body which serves as the mobile anterior portion. Along the mid-sagittal line, the midline groove divides the tongue into left and right sides. Running transversely along the tongue is the V-shaped terminal sulcus. At the apex of the terminal sulcus is the foramen cecum, a small impression representing the embryological remnant of the thyroglossal duct, formed during the descent of the thyroid gland into its anatomical position. Incomplete closure of this passage results in a patent thyroglossal duct, which can lead to the development of a thyroglossal cyst postnatally, which is considered the most common cause of a midline mass within the neck in children under the age of 10. The upper dorsal surface of the tongue is covered in numerous taste receptors or taste buds that can generally be classified into three types based on form and function. Filiform and fungiform papillae have a filamentous shape and are dispersed widely along the anterior surface of the tongue. Their names describe their general appearance. Whereas filiform papilla have a filamentous shape, fungiform papilla have more of a mushroom appearance to them. Toward the back of the tongue are the valate papilla. These disc-shaped structures contain a furrow in which the receptive taste centers are located. The dendritic nerve endings are chemoreceptors that bind to small molecules from ingested food that are dissolved in the saliva. The complex sensory messages triggered from the specific combination of stimulated chemoreceptors results in the seemingly infinite sensations that we interpret as taste. Given the complexity of movements involved, it shouldn't be surprising to learn that a large number of muscles are involved in the movement of the tongue. The majority of the tongue itself is composed of a complex array of intrinsic muscles that project in numerous directions and serve to alter the conformation of the body of the tongue, which will assist in moving food morsels around for chewing and in generating complex phonations during speech. In addition, a number of extrinsic tongue muscles anchor to the posterior body and root of the tongue to generate more pronounced movements. The majority of these muscles have glossus in the name, and with the exception of the palatal glossus muscle previously mentioned, which is innervated by the vagus nerve, muscles containing the root glossus in their name are all innervated by the hypoglossal nerve. The floor of the mouth is formed by the mylohyoid muscle. This is a suprahyoid muscle rather than an extrinsic tongue muscle, as it has no direct attachment to the tongue but it does assist in defining the inferior most boundary of the oral cavity. The mylohyoid originates off the broad mylohyoid line found along the internal surface of the mandible and fuses with the contralateral side along a median ridge with the inferoposterior portion anchoring to the superior surface of the hyoid bone. The muscle is innervated by the appropriately named nerve to mylohyoid which branches from the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve prior to it diving into the mandibular foramen. The muscle functions in either elevating the hyoid bone or depressing the mandible, 
depending on the synergistic muscles that are activated along with it. For example, contraction of the mylohyoid along with elevators of the mandible, such as the masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid, will result in elevation of the hyoid. On the other hand, when the mylohyoid is activated along with depressors of the hyoid bone, such as sternohyoid, sternothyroid, and thyrohyoid, the muscle serves to depress the mandible. The mylohyoid also serves to tense the floor of the oral cavity, providing greater stability for the root of the tongue during ingestion and speech. The geniohyoid muscle is another of the suprahyoid muscles we are observing for the first time. It is a cylindrical muscle found superior to mylohyoid, originating off the mental spine on the internal surface of the mandible and inserting on the superior surface of the hyoid bone. It receives its innervation from branches off the first cervical spinal nerve, which forms the anterior loop of the ansa cervicalis that fuses with the hypoglossal nerve. The genioglossus works in synergy with the mylohyoid in either elevation of the hyoid or depression of the mandible. The first of the intrinsic muscles to discuss is genioglossus. It originates off the mental spine of the mandible, just superior to the geniohyoid and its fibers project backwards in a fan-like pattern, with the inferior fibers inserting into the root of the tongue and superior fibers on the inferior surface of the body. Contracting the geniohyoid assists with protrusion of the tongue forward, as when you are asked to stick out your tongue. Unilateral contraction of the geniohyoid causes greater protrusion on the ipsilateral side, resulting in deviation of the tongue to the contralateral side. The superior fibers also serve to depress the body of the tongue towards the floor of the oral cavity. The hyoglossus is located posterolaterally in the oral cavity. Its fibers project superiorly off the lateral arms of the hyoid to insert into the lateral aspect of the root of the tongue. Contraction of the hyoglossus depresses and retracts the tongue. The styloglossus originates off the styloid process along with the stylohyoid and digastric muscles. Its fibers project into the superolateral aspect of the root of the tongue. Styloglossus contracts to retract and elevate the tongue. A number of nerves are observed entering the oral cavity, each bringing a specific type of innervation. We first observe the lingual nerve as a branch off the trigeminal nerve from within the infratemporal fossa. The lingual nerve projects to the floor of the oral cavity and branches extensively to supply general sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The lingual nerve also receives contributions from the chordae tympani, which brings parasympathetics to the submandibular and sublingual glands, which stimulate salivation, and taste fibers that supply taste sensation to the same area of the dorsal tongue surface. The glossopharyngeal nerve enters the posterior aspect of the oral cavity from between the palatal glossal and palatal pharyngeal folds. It supplies both general and taste sensation from the posterior two-thirds of the tongue. It should also be noted that the internal laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve supplies a small region of taste sensation to the base of the tongue in this region. Finally, the hypoglossal nerve enters the posterolateral aspect of the oral cavity just inferior to the stylohyoid and digastric muscle bellies. As previously described, this supplies most of the glossal muscles that move the tongue. Vascular supply to the tongue is through the lingual artery, which branches from the external carotid artery to pass deep to the hyoglossus muscle. Dorsal lingual branches supply the root of the tongue while the deep lingual branches supply the body. Veins with similar names will drain the tongue into the internal jugular vein. The salivary glands are responsible for the production of saliva, a slightly viscous aqueous solution that moistens the oral cavity and morsels of food undergoing mechanical digestion through chewing. The enzyme salivary amylase will begin the chemical digestion of carbohydrate chains prior to swallowing. We have already seen the parotid glands within the infratemporal regions, which deliver secretions to the oral cavity through the parotid duct. This generates about 20% of the salivary volume, 
which is primarily serous in nature. We've also observed the prominent submandibular gland within the submandibular triangle of the neck. The substance of this gland continues into the oral cavity superior to the mylohyoid muscle when the submandibular duct projects anteriorly where it loops over top of the lingual nerve and drains into the floor of the oral cavity through bilateral sublingual caruncles. The submandibular gland is responsible for the majority of oral secretions, producing around 70% of salivary volume. The triangular-shaped sublingual gland lies entirely within the oral cavity, just deep to the oral mucosa along the floor of the mouth and resting upon the mylohyoid muscle. It drains through a series of small excretory ducts, with the largest of these fusing with the submandibular duct to drain through the sublingual caruncle. The sublingual gland is only responsible for approximately 5% of salivary secretions and is more mucoid in its consistency. The remainder of the volume is generated by various glands located deep to the mucosal membrane lying in the oral cavity. That's going to do it for our lecture on the oral cavity and tongue. As we near the end of our journey into the head and neck, we will reflect on a number of previously explained topics with a detailed discussion of the cranial nerves. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.